no idea that Reverend Daughtry was going to be in the house tonight. And uh, if I had known he was coming, he would have been on the program. That's right. Yes, he indeed. Been the program. <laughs> and he just showed up. I didn't even know. And then when I found out it was him, I said, oh, you preaching here at Amazon here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I love Reverend Daughtry. I've known Reverend Daughtry for a long time. And I can remember the first time I had to find my way to the House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn, down there uh, near Atlantic Avenue. Because I, I, I'm totally a Jersey boy. I'm so parochial. I, I, New York for me was Manhattan. I think one of my one of my first visits to Brooklyn was the House of the Lord Church, and uh, had to find my way uh, over there. And once I did, I fell in love. I'll tell you how long I've known Reverend Daughtry. When I met you, Reverend Daughtry, first time I came to House of the Lord Church. Charles Barron hadn't even been elected to office yet. He was still with the African Christian yeah. men's group yeah, that you had, which was a, a black liberation Christian uh, theological uh, organization. That's right. That's and that, that Charles Barron wasn't even an assemblyman. He was working with Reverend Daughtry, and I came to you. So that was many, many years ago. But Reverend Daughtry has been in the struggle for black liberation and human liberation for over 75 years, more than that? Not, 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 not that long. Not that long, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> uh, about a little over 60. But you were in the struggle, Yousef Hawkins? Oh, yeah. Yousef Hawkins, oh, yeah. Michael Stewart? Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. And uh, and then the current ones we know some of y'all might not know Yusuf Hawkins, uh, but more current I'm gonna do Diallo and uh, Abner Luima, you know, and uh, uh, Sean Bell. Yes, yes, yes. But Reverend Daughtry is a a great freedom fighter and a and a resident of New Jersey. <laughs> oh yeah, a resident of New Jersey. He has marched with us. In New Jersey, That's right. and uh, and then uh, four years ago, when I had my um, uh, the car accident that nearly took my life, wow. Reverend Daughtry visited me in the hospital oh. and prayed over me and prayed for my recovery and prayed for my salvation. And. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I could even talk when you came, if I still had the tubes. I had two tubes down, not one, two tubes down my throat, one for each lung. But Reverend Daughtry came and visited me and then just didn't visit me in the hospital, but continued to maintain contact with me after I was out of the hospital. So we know Reverend Daughtry is a great, Freedom fighter. Yeah, that's right. I heard him recently in an interview. I think it was a WBAI interview where you had been invited to attend the funeral of Winnie Mandela. Right. That yeah. you were there in South Africa, right. in, the stadium, in the stadium, where Winnie Mandela's funeral. So that that video we watched <laughs> of uh, <laughs> Julius <laughs> Malema giving it, Reverend yeah. Daughtry yeah. saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Mama, they all hear that's right, that's right. Reverend Daughtry is there. So I love Reverend Daughtry. I love uh, the work that the House of the Lord does. Uh, Pop is known for fighting police brutality. Reverend Daughtry was fighting police brutality before the People's Organization for Progress even came into existence. So I'm so glad that Reverend Daughtry made this surprise visit to us tonight. And say, but I want you, Reverend Daughtry, to give us, share some thoughts with us on Martin Luther King and, and the meaning of his life and his relationship to our struggle and anything you want to say, anything you think <laughs> we need to know. You don't have to keep it to Dr. King. Uh -huh. Give him a big hand, Reverend Herbert Daughtry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that I should go out and 
come back in again. <laughs> Lord, if I ever decide uh, to run for some office um, anywhere, I surely want you to come here and recruit my campaign manager. <laughs> you have given me such an enthusiastic uh, welcome. And uh, I am home uh, here. Of course, wherever Larry is, that, that I am there too. And uh, we have a mutual admiration society. Um, there are not many uh, still around with the um, long time credibility that he has garnered across the years. And we should cher cher treasure him as I know we, we do. But he's special. Uh, believe me, uh, they come and they go. And they come for various reasons. And they go for various reasons. But some stay on the wall, just, they just stay on the wall. So when you get thrown up, um, I just turned double, double eight. I was 88, wow. and I didn't think I'd make it out of the teens, <laughs> you know, but uh, some people try to hide their age, and, but I'm so glad that I reached 88, I, I shouted from the highest mountain. <laughs> 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 88 is only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God uh, have I reached this, this, this stage, because you know I'm one of the original OGs. You <laughs> used to be uh, one of the stamping grounds, stamping grounds a long time ago. Uh, so uh, it's just good to be in your presence. And I'm with a couple of very, very important, influential ladies, and I said we got to go over and see Larry because he having the pop is having a rally. Yeah. And let me introduce Mr. Hesse Williams. Ms. Hesse Williams. <laughs> she had founded and hit a group called Mother's Pain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Her yes. son, Lou, yes. Lou, 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 That's Lou, right. Luanda, um Williams, Looney, mm -hmm. we called him 17 when he was shot in the head oh, wow. uh, uh, back in uh, mm. August. 1960, 19, um, three years ago, about three years ago now. And he, um, you, you know, I call them wounded healers. Yes. There are some people who can absorb their pain. Yes. And, and, and while hurting, um, are healers. Yeah, they hurt and heal. Wow. Those few people who come to the stage of history and she happens to be one of those persons who founded the Mothers of uh, the Mothers of Pain and, uh, in Jersey City, and uh, have uh, we marched and did the usual march rallies, uh, annual we go uh, car caravan across the city, and uh, she's just been a very powerful, powerful spokesperson. In fact, uh, to so much so that. Governor Murphy, in his inaugural, mm -hmm. invited her to come and sit with him and, uh, and recognize uh, her mm -hmm. uh, in his speech. Wow. Yeah, so and invited her back. So she's a very, very, as I said, I, 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 uh, and Larry has indicated, I guess I started in 1972 uh, mm. in Brooklyn. Mm. Um, Clifford Glover. Yes, Steve. yes. And when he was shot in the back. And yeah. in 1973, uh, there was Ricky Borden from Staten Island. I think he was 11, so the police were really right. coming on up, you know, I guess, uh, uh, up the ladder. And then in 1974, it was Claude Reese. He was 14, yeah. 15. Yeah. 1976, it was Ricky uh, Claude. Randy Evans. Randy Evans. Yeah, yep. remember he shot mm -hmm. Randy. His defense was he had psychomotor epileptic seizures. That was the defense of the police officer, mm -hmm. which was which was sufficient 
uh, to get him sentenced to psychiatric treatment with weekend home. <laughs> so it was this act that infuriated the people in Brooklyn to the extent that they wanted to do something about it. We had been meeting, by the way, about four, four of us had been meeting. Brooklyn is a I mean, it must, we must have more people of every kind of background you can mention. You say, you, you, you just name a country. <laughs> Somebody was talking about it, you know, I'm from there. So we're talking about the diaspora, where we have it in Brooklyn, and yet we're pretty much powerless. And mm. Randy Evans uh, we were organizing, and that gave us the fury of the uh, community to mobilize. And we said that Randy Evans' memory would never die. Mm. And we were going to build a movement and power the people. And so we have. We, mm -hmm. uh, we, we launched Black Christmas 77. Right. And shut down New York. Yeah. Uh, so, but Ms. Hesse, I'd like to share this space, ask her to say something to us, Ms. Hesse. Williams, uh, well, you know, President Mullins, Mother of the <laughs> I'm very proud to say that she's a member of our church uh, also. And uh, we, I just, it just, there's so much inspiration that they provide. Just, you know, that to be hurting and healing. Yes. You know, for those of us who follow Jesus Christ, he was the ultimate uh, wounded healer. You know, wounded yet healing. And so, Mrs. Essie Wade. Hello. 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 Thank you. Well, like Pastor said, my name is Hesse Williams. I'm from Jersey City. I formed an organization called the Mother's Pain. This organization was formed because I lost my son to gun violence August 9, 2016. And I decided that I wasn't going to be in quiet no more. That I was going to get some mothers that had some spunk like me. And we was going to go out there right. and tell the city what we need for our children. That's right. Um, he said, let's say something about Dr. Martin Luther King, right? Mm -hmm. So I was reading about the King the other day, and I came a couple, came a course, across a couple of quotes that I like, and this is one of them. I want to share with you guys. He said, our lives begin and end the day we become silent about things that matter. Well, and if we don't keep talking out about this gun violence, we're going to continue to use, lose our youth. Right. So we got to come together mm -hmm. and fight this mission together. That's right. Okay? Thank y'all for having me. Right. And of course, the other young lady with us is, is our church clerk, who just is, he does so much good work for us, uh, Miss Janelle Deeks. Well, the. The, um, just to think about Dr. King a minute, we, uh, and, and, and in fact, I was vice chair of Operation Breadbasket mm. in New York uh, when Jesse Jackson was the national uh, leader. Uh, it was Dr. King's idea that once we had gained social mobility, but the money wasn't there to go to the places that they, we could now go. <laughs> so he came up with the idea of approaching corporate America uh, with demands that they uh, give back to the community right. some of what they are taking out. And so Breadbasket was formed. Jesse was the yes. national director in New York, uh, Reverend Dr. William Jones of Bethany Baptist Church was the chair. I was the executive vice chair. This was in the 60s. And um, it was with King. In fact, I was at the Riverside Church uh, the night he delivered um, the uh, and he wore, quote, uh, uh, a statement of why I opposed the war in Vietnam. Uh, so we had those of us, in, especially 
uh, coming out of the South, in fact, as you know, and I think it was Kwame Stokely who named him the Lord. You know, yeah, the, the Lord. He was so highly regarded because, again, those of us who came who've come out of the South understood the, the rigid, dehumanizing, yes, yes, segregating yes. system, yes. and the 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 the, the frustration and yes. despair of trying to figure a way to fight back. Uh, every kind of dehumanizing right. act yes. you can mention was taking place. Yes. And what precipitated uh, the movement uh, was Rosa Parks, as you well know. Yes. But can you imagine now, these many years later, uh, getting on the bus, paying your money on the bus, getting off, and getting in the back. Yes. And you could stay there as long as no white person wanted yes. your seat. Yes. Yes. Even if a little 10 year old uh, came to your grandmother and said, Get up, Auntie, because you were never Mrs. or Mr. They said, Get up, Auntie, and you have to get up. Yes. And unless you want to go to jail, or worse, going wow. to jail would have been. Uh, yes. Blessing. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, real <laughs> blessing <laughs> those yeah. days. And so it, it was so dehumanizing, and so yeah. Dr. King found a way to fight back. Yeah. It was not what he had set out to do. He was hoping to become president of some university. He was a very brilliant man, or president of the Baptist Convention. But you know, destiny of God uh, uh, lays hands on people and uh, they find themselves being captured uh, for a cause. And I remember uh, the story uh, Dr. Gardner Taylor used to tell me and um, Daddy King were friends. And Daddy King had invited uh, some of his um, colleagues down to um, down to, I think it was Alabama, uh, Montgomery, because Dr. King's home had been bombed. And they uh, tried to persuade him to quit. And said, Doc, you, you know what's going to happen. Your home has been bombed, and they're going to kill you. And so he went in the kitchen, away from the gathering of these eminent preachers, and he prayed. And he returned uh, to the meeting. And he said, I can't quit. Mm. I can't quit. Mm. And of course, he must have known that he would not die an ordinary death. Mm. But I, I think he got a bum rap from some of us who uh, were considered militant. Come on, Don. And, and the radical element. I, I don't know why you know somebody got together and elected me chair of the National Black United Front. Uh -huh. And we were the preeminent radicals. And yes. we, we, right, we had all of you, you name buff. it. And buff. Yeah, and buff. Mm -hmm. That's right. We had, in fact, Mary Baraka was one of my great supporters. And uh, we had every religious representative represented. And we had the full field of, uh, of radicalism and revolution and whatever. I guess because I was uh, had come up out of the streets of Jersey City in Brooklyn. And you know, uh, we say, listen, I ain't scared of y'all. I don't care what you change your name to, I don't care, you know, what you wear, I don't, you, you know. And not only that, but that, that's where my heart is. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, I was in the church. But I, I understood where we were coming from. Uh, but Dr. King, uh, there was a speech that I did in 1982. Uh, it, it was, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Which was the title of his last book. And I remember, uh, lifting out 
what Dr. King had said, uh, admitting that the civil rights movement had not dug deep enough, uh, had not made the radical changes that uh, people who were in it wanted to make. And so he called for a radical redistribution of uh -oh. political and economic uh -oh. power. Right. Uh -oh. yeah. You know, revolutionary talk comes in all kind of guises. Doesn't necessarily come with the rhetoric, you know. Uh, Dr. King used to love to quote the old prophet Isaiah. Uh, the days will come when every valley shall be lifted up. Right. And every mountain shall be brought low. And the crooked places made straight, and the rough places made smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be seen in the valley, and all flesh shall see it together. Well, I don't know how much more revolutionary you get <laughs> than that kind of language. It's poetic language for the equalization of society. And I guess that's revolutionary talk. I remember trying to say to uh, people some time, see, we got to not be so predictable, not use the same language that they expect us to use, right. but to be revolutionary uh, is to know what kind of language you're using and to be able to maneuver. I think they all told us that. Malcolm used to say that. So Dr. King was more radical than we think, and his radicalism was eventually people understood it perhaps more than we did. Mm. You know, it used to you know, bother me, I understood it, because, you know, that was my crowd. But to stand on 125th Street, <laughs> you know, talking about what I do down there, when he's down there, right. you yeah. know, yeah. trying to right. use right. the, the right. tactic right. that right. would get results. That's, that's I talking. mean, that's what right. do you do against the people who got their own the Air Force, the Navy, the Air Force? Right. Marines, the, 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 the police, the National Guard, the, all the weight of law enforcement. There got to be some way. I mean, are we going to NASA? So we had one, we, you know. So, I mean, what is the tactic that you're going to use against that kind of power? Well, he used that force of nonviolence, just don't participate. And the fact that our people followed that got results. So I think that he was far more radical than we realized. And even when Black Power came, uh, Kwame had argued, and he had argued on the march to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. he was not opposed to Black Power, uh, but he felt that that was not uh, going to be productive at that time. And it's very interesting that when James Meredith was shot and they gathered in the hospital, uh, they were going to complete his march uh, through Mississippi. Right. And they gathered at the, around his bed, Roy Wilkins, uh, Floyd McKissick from CORE, uh, Roy Wilkins, NAACP, um, uh, the Urban League, uh, what was that? From? Whitney Young. Whitney Young, Urban League, and, uh, and Kwame who at that time she Snake. Right. And uh, they debated um, which, how they were going to do this. And of course, Dokley wanted to uh, keep it local, local leaders, you know, grassroots, uh, while Roy and Whitney wanted to uh, bring in President Johnson had already committed uh, to the march and the union had committed to the march. So they had this debate. Uh, about how they were going to proceed. And it was times core, uh, Floyd McKiss McKiss McKissick, McKissick uh, voted for the local uh, involvement, that the local leadership uh, should lead and continue mobilizing. And um, uh, Roy Wilkins and um, Whitney Young voted to bring in the top guns from the White House clear across the Union. So they waited for Dr. King, mm -hmm. and his vote would 
obviously carried the day. And he came uh, to the hospital bed, and they waited to, which way, well, you would generally think that Dr. King is going between the Young and with Roy Wilkins, that's what we generally think of him. But Dr. King went with Stokely oh. and with McKissick. Um, and they want to sustain the march with local leadership and President Johnson and the union leadership uh, would, would, would not necessarily be invited at least to be in charge. So there was that radical dimension about Dr. King. But above all, he was, you know, he was, he was committed uh, to our struggle and to our people. And uh, he, 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 I guess, if you could think of uh, a man who carried on his shoulders uh, the pain of, of a struggle and, and most of all, maybe, what might have been the, the unkindest cut of all is so many of us didn't quite understand where he was coming from, right? Uh, Malcolm and Martin got together from, at some point, but even Malcolm was one of his super critics. Yes. Uh, and again, we just didn't understand uh, what the language he was using, um, what he was doing, uh, and, and the fact that when he, did, he was at Riverside Church, never will forget, when he came out against the wall in Vietnam. <laughs> man, oh man. I mean, it, it was as though the whole world turned against him. And uh, the other thing, fine, I'm trying to close, is that when he was planning the Pope People's Campaign, um, can you imagine that he was saying, we're going to stay in Washington until the government finally deliver on its promise. Uh, we, we're not coming home this time. We're not catching the first plane, smoking out of Washington. But this time we're there to stay, to tie up Washington so that nothing moves. Uh, no plane flies, no rhymes, nothing moves in Washington until the nation finally delivers on its promise. It's no wonder he had to be killed. He was against the war, uh, opposing President Johnson, who had been his so-called friend, uh, black leadership, and the word was out that they had planned his suicide. They had planned uh, already to have somebody in place called Tell Pro. We ought not to be surprised about yes, yes, what the yes. FBI does. I mean, yes. I'm a long ways from Trump, whatever yes. Trump is saying. Uh, uh, it, it, it has to be far from the truth. But the FBI is, is always, hands have been dirty uh, thank relating you, thank to you, us. Thank you, thank you. I chaired the FBI activities in the 60s mm, in Washington, D.C., in which all of the people from the Panthers and the nation that came forward with their documentation as to what the FBI had done to them. Uh, so with Dr. King, it seemed the whole world uh, had turned against him. But nonetheless, he held fast, he held steady uh, to what he believed. And so his memory will live on and we'll understand it better by and by, you know. So we continue to struggle right on. I know a little bit about those days, as I said, uh, when we were, I was, I was blessed uh, to have the support on both sides. I guess you come at a time in history, progress, uh, the wheels of progress seem to churn on a clock, you know. Uh, there is a saying from the European, you know, Victor Hugo said, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Uh, and Andy Shakespeare has a quote that I love. There was a time in the affairs of men, pardon his chauvinism, you know. There was a tide in the affairs, I would say, of people taken at its current, leads on to fortune, neglected. We spent our days beating in the shallows. 
And theologically, you know, there is the term Kairos. Anybody hear Kairos time? Mm -hmm. And it means that there's God's time. Yes. You know, yes. the, the time that God had. King used to love to quote the German, the Scheißgeist is a spirit yes, in, in, of timing that when it strikes, that and it, it, anybody can be the, the, the catalyst. Yes. And often is people you would not expect. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Whoever thought that the catalyst for a movement that altered the flow of history would be a frail, <clears throat> unassuming woman who refused to get up out of her seat yes. even though big strong men got up. Yes. Mm. Who would have picked <laughs> a, 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 a frail woman that, but God, I think God has a sense of humor, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, God picks people that society rejects and say, you the person uh, that I'm going to use at this point in history. So there is a timing about things, there's a timing. And, and you know, Pop, I, the reason why, one of the reasons why he's been in business to come here, um, uh, and always following you, uh, Larry Helm and the movement yes. of pop yes. people is because you stayed with it. Mm -hmm. And I always want to give encouragement because sometimes we think because we don't have thousands of people, mm -hmm. we're not doing too much. Mm -hmm. And we misread our own contribution. We, we misread the impact we are making because we don't have a lot of people all over the place and sometimes don't even have authorities, you know, the usual success as we would define it. But uh, don't belittle what you're doing. Yeah, don't dismiss uh, what you're doing. Your impact has been felt for and near. In high places as well as so-called low places. Uh, to be encouraged about the work you're doing. To be encouraged uh, about the success that you've had in terms of the impact that you've made. Because whenever Pop's name is mentioned, and whenever Larry's name is mentioned, uh, it's mentioned with credibility. When we, when we meet and talk about leaders, you had a past and who did what and whatever, whatever. Well, listen, we know who the charlatans are. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes those who are getting all the press, we know better. You know, we just don't say what, uh, what, what the real deal is. But there are some leaders, there are some people who have been on the wall, have been consistent, been dependable who know that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. What you see is what you get. There are few around today, and Larry happens to be one of them. So stay on the wall, don't quit, doing a great work. And from the old Black United Front days, we are fired up and going to take no more. Take no more. A little island uh, came the revolution in 1979, March 1979. Great friend, young man, led the revolution, a um, Marsh Bishop. And uh, they came up with the saying that we adopted. What? Forward ever. Back Yeah, you got it. Forward ever. Forward ever. Forward ever. God bless you, man. God bless you. Just, just, just one more thing, Reverend, before you go. Tell us, I have to ask, tell us, you met Dr. King in person. Right.
tell us what you felt when you really met. Tell us what you really felt really, right. when you met him. He was the, the Lord. <laughs> you know, again, coming out of the South, you, you, knowing the struggle. My brother, one of my oldest brothers, you know, they had the program where they just gathered a black man on the chain gang. It was, it was really free labor. So many ways that they dehumanized us. And Dr. King gave us a way to fight back. You know, that this is the way you can fight back and this is the way you can win. So, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois said that when he met Alexander Cromel, the theologian, he instinctively bowed. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. when I met him, he somebody. Alexander Cromel sold a black folk, but he said that this theologian, Alexander Cromel, when he met him, he instinctively bowed. And then W.E.B. Du Bois, he don't bow to anybody. But, uh, this theologian had done such great work. And so when I met Dr. King, he sort of instinctively bowed uh, to him. He's very, you know, very strength, very strong. You got the feeling of strength, of courage, but of humility. You know, uh, people who are sincerely strong and who are sincerely courageous uh, have an openness about them and the humility yeah. about them. The Bible said Moses was meek man, humble man, and all of the great leaders I met uh, had that feeling. You mentioned Winnie Mandela. Yeah. Well, more than that, I was invited to participate in Nelson's funeral. There yeah. were only 17 ministers that participated in his funeral in his ancestral homeland in Quinu, South Africa. And uh, the only two uh, outside of South Africa was Reverend Jackson and myself. Wow. With the two of us who put the dirt down and saw the boys. They tell me that uh, you're not supposed to talk about how a king is buried. So I don't say too much about it, but I was there. It was only 400 people invited uh, to the burial, only 4,000 invited to the funeral, uh, and then after the funeral, we marched about 50 yards up the hill uh, for the actual burial. We did what we do as clergy, uh, even before the family came forward, and even before the ANC leadership came forward, and we were there for Nelson Mandela. As I stood there and realizing that uh, everybody in the world give everything they had to be among the 400 that were invited to the actual burial. And there we sat with my grandson, and, and, and the, the burial came, time come for the burial, uh, they invited us to come forward and participate in the actual burial. And we had met uh, Nelson Mandela, and again, this the same kind of feeling uh, that I got from King, and I got from uh, uh, Mandela. You know, powerful and know it, and don't have to show it. <laughs> you know, and uh, then when when Winnie, Winnie, Winnie made her first public statement at our church, you know, they tried to keep her from talking to NC. Well, we can't let Winnie talk. He said, No, no, you can't come to our church and and, and tell her you can't speak. And so she made her first statement there. So we were invited back into the time uh, uh, that she had her, her funeral. I was invited back to uh, South Africa. So um, it's life for me um, has been, uh, I'm like an old man, um, like a spectator watching a drama unfold, as I said, uh, tell the world know, came straight out of the streets of Jersey City. I mean, as I said, we thought we'd never get out of our teens. We adopted the saying, live fast, die young, have a good look at corpse. And mm -hmm. so all of the stuff that these young people are doing, I did. And I had a religious, Malcolm said, he found Allah, well, I found Jesus 
or at least they found us. <laughs> right. And it's in, in the narrow jail cells in Jersey City in 1953. Mm. You know, and getting ready to do a whole, it's a long time for armed robbery, you assault with a weapon, yeah. uh, um, weapon possession, yeah. and even even the government won't look yeah. peace with me. I was yeah. money laundering, all that. So I came straight out of the streets of, of Jersey City and yeah, Newark too. We used to be over here in Newark. Used to, oh, yeah. used to play skins. Yeah, Newark was a center for skin. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't know what skin is called. <laughs> and guys, you know, those kind of hustles. And uh, so I, 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 I am now 88, traveling the world. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and from, from the Vatican to the White House. You know, but most of all, I'm from the streets of Jersey City and and and, and Brooklyn. Yeah. So I'm like, an, I'm sort of watching uh, a drama unfold, uh, blessed on every side. Uh, wonderful friends like Pop, like Larry, you know. And when you get my age, you, you begin to realize that what is important in life and it is the people that you meet and form associations. Yeah. You come here to this stage of life, you number your friends and the associations that you had, uh, and you treasure them because I got your picture on the walls when I, you know, go to my office. And if I get kicked out, it's because my wife said I got too many papers and books and stuff in the house. I know that feeling. <laughs> I've been married 56 years, you know, 56 years. And, and, and you know, in our religion, you, you only get one, you know. Yeah, you only get one. I had to, when I got one, 50, 56 years. Can you imagine 56 years? Just one, just one, just one. 56 years, four children. In fact, my son was son was a assistant superintendent of schools over here yes, some years ago. That's right. I he's, a, he's a trainer now, principals and teachers. And you know, my daughter was the CEO of the 2008 Democratic Convention, the one that propelled President Obama in the office. And then Hillary asked her to come back. Would you please come back and do it again? So she was a CEO in 2016. First person that they've ever asked to come back and do it again twice. Uh, she, and that's my eldest daughter. Uh, and so I'm just a blessed man, and but still concerned as to where we are as a people. And I would, you know, don't worry about, don't get despair about Trumps. We've seen Trumps before. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We grew up with Bill Bowen and, and the Mississippi and Talmadge in Georgia. And that's why, you know, uh, when people start talking about, the, you know, Bin Laden, you know, Bin Laden. I mean, we live with Bin Laden. That's, that, that's, that we normalize terrorism. Terrorism we had to live with all the time we've been here. Right. Ah, but thank God we've overcome. We've That's come right. this far by faith. And uh, through segregation and discrimination and lynchings and all the horrors of which mm. human beings can visit upon other beings, we've come this far. And I'm certain that we didn't come this far to leave. And I, uh, maybe that's the place to go with Dr. K. Uh, and, and, and going to the mountain, you know, I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we're going to make it as a people. Always as a people, not an individual, but as a people, we're going to make the promised land. God bless you all. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. Come on. Give me a big hand. The meeting is adjourned. No, I'm <laughs> I mean, really, we could, but we won't. Um, we're not going to do nothing else but the program tonight. Um, we're going to go right. Reverend Daughtry was a surprise, um, the most pleasant surprise we could have had tonight. We, we would have to look far and wide to 
have a more direct connection to the civil rights movement and the black liberation movement, both. This is a man that was in the civil rights and the black power Amen. movement. And uh, we're so glad he stopped by. So give us three minutes and we're going to finish setting up. Reverend Daughtry caught us before we could even get set up. Yep. We're going to finish set up and then we'll have our speakers, the other speakers for tonight. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Long live Martin Luther King. 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 We uh, were blessed to have a surprise visit by Reverend Herbert Daughtry. And uh, it was quite a surprise, kind of threw us off stride in terms of getting started. But I don't think anybody in this room feels that that was not time well spent to hear from Reverend Daughtry. We're here to observe the 90th anniversary of the birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was one of the foremost advocates for civil and human rights that we have ever had, not just in the 20th century, but one of the foremost that we have had here in the history of the United States of America. And I want to get right to our guests who took time out from their day to be here to share some thoughts with us. Uh, some of them you have heard from before, some of them you haven't, but all of them you need to hear tonight. Uh, just a preliminary note. It's important to remember that Dr. King did not die a natural death. He didn't die of disease of cancer, he didn't have a heart attack, he didn't have a stroke, he didn't die in his home or in his bed. He was assassinated. And as far as we are concerned, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King is still an open case, and those who are responsible for his death should still be brought to justice, no matter how long it takes. Mrs. King, in 1999, brought suit in federal court that Dr. King's assassination was the product of a conspiracy that involved multiple intelligence agencies. That's right. And a federal judge ruled in favor of Mrs. King. So if anybody tells you that it was just James Earl Ray that assassinated Dr. King, you tell them that is not what the legal record says. That is a popular narrative promulgated by the federal government. It is a story that is convenient to those who in fact part of the conspiracy. Dr. King was assassinated and in that lawsuit, the federal judge says that 11, at the time that I discovered this, I didn't even know there were 11 intelligence agencies in the United States of America. Eleven right. intelligence agencies were, it, were connected and eleven intelligence agencies and the Memphis police, yes, yes, yes. the city of Memphis yes, police yes. department were all part of that conspiracy to, that led to the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. And in, as time goes on, as we approach the anniversary of this assassination, we'll bring in more people to address this and discuss the evidence for it. But Dr. King, we, we campaign against police brutality. Martin Luther King was a victim of police state brutality. He was a victim of police state brutality, and his name has to go right along with all those other names that we mentioned when we protest during Justice Mondays. So the, the death of Martin Luther King is still an open issue as far as we're concerned. So tonight, the first person I'm going to ask to speak is someone that hasn't spoken to us in a while. But he is our good friend, supports everything we do. Um, he has had me come and speak at Essex County College several times. And so let us welcome in the warmest possible way 
our brother and fellow freedom fighter, Dr. Akil Kalfani. Give him a big hand. Good evening, everybody. How's everyone tonight? Good. All right, good. So um, I want to first thank Pop, thank Larry, and uh, uh, I want to uh, say that the first thing I want, I really want us to think about, is that as we are, we were here today, and we had the blessing to uh, hear the words of Reverend Daughtry. Uh, one of the things I often say uh, as, a, as a line that I a quote uh, that I uh, my, my own quote, but at the bottom of my text message or my email messages, it says. Um, the fool speaks loudly about with that which he or she doesn't know, while the wise sits quietly at the feet of the elders. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would suggest that today we all had an opportunity to sit silently at the feet of the elders. And so it's a blessing to have had that opportunity. And I would say that uh, when I sit at the feet of uh, my elders here at the tables, uh, that, that also I have that blessing. And so that when we think about what we do, that, that each of us, I believe, has the responsibility to recognize that there's someone who knows something more about something that you know or that you know a little bit about, that there is a, a place for growth, place for insight, place for understanding, and that we want to continue how we uh, pursue anything that we know, but we want to c continue with that in the process or in the context of finding folks who know more than us, right? And so that uh, uh, one of the things that I, that I like about um, uh, some things that I learned about uh, King, uh, my daughter said the other day, she was saying that, uh, she said, well, uh, you know, I know all this stuff about King, but I didn't know he wrote books. I said, oh, okay, good. Well, now we're going to get you some books, right? So that, uh, that each time somebody, even the youth, right, we learn from them. So sometimes we make assumptions about the things that they know and they don't know the things that we think they know. And so therefore, they give us opportunities, if we see them, to teach them. Mm -hmm. And so we want to capitalize on those opportunities. And so I think that what we have to do is we have to find out that there's a two-way street. And one of the things that, that we see in, in Dr. King is that he was teaching and learning at the same time. Yeah. Right? Teaching and learning. And many of us, especially once we get educated, we think that we've learned all that we have to learn and all we have to do is to teach. And I would suggest to us that that's one of the biggest flaws. Uh, because one of the things for me is that uh, the, the more you know, the less you know. That is, the, the more you know, there's, you know that there's so much more to be known that you know that you're ignorant of so much more. Right? And so that the, the wise person is that is he or she who is actually the most ignorant. Right? Because they, they know that there's so much more that, that, that about this life we, we have, that we live. And when we think about uh, uh, King, and I, I just did a radio interview, as a matter of fact, before I came in here. And I was speaking up precisely about that point about revolution. And I think that we have to go back to that point. And I think that uh, uh, Reverend Daughtry uh, uh, made some poignant remarks about us understanding about revolution and that we have, I uh, believe, misconceptions about what revolution is and what it's not. Uh -huh. We think that revolution means that you have to have a, a, a gun or some bombs or, or something. But revolution, what he was talking about was the revolution of an idea. Uh, he was talking about the revolution of, of your mind and that, that, that we need to, uh, most of our minds, based on uh, white supremacy and, and capitalism and all these other things, have been brain dirtied, actually. And we need a good brainwashing. Right? Uh, the, the, all that dirt that's gone up in there, they confuse you by the terminology, in fact. Uh, that when you think that you need a, uh, that someone's brain washed you, uh, washing suggests cleansing. Washing suggests that it's prepared for something else, right? That you've gotten off the, the odor and the grime and everything else. But they've given you nothing but odor and grime. And we wallow in it. And so we need to get rid of that odor and that grime so that we can be uh, uh, cleansed so that we can actually open our minds and our eyes to realize that there's value of something still out there that we've missed, right? And so uh, maybe I'm talking to the choir, but I think that uh, even in the choir sometimes uh, the message that we hear sometimes uh, gets stale or gets so repetitive that 
that we need to hear it from a different voice or a different way so that we can realize that there's a different way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we realize that there's value in still doing it. Because sometimes we forget that there's value in doing the things that we do. And we think that, well, I'm just going up here. I'm going to do just another march. Uh, that's not going to make any difference. But really, that may be the one day that the kid comes across the street from Essex and they're like, man, this is what I've been looking for. Man, this is, this is, this is important for us to, to be able to, that we can be impactful. And so that I think that uh, uh, even though we don't get a lot of young folks to come over to the marches and rallies, I think that uh, every time I tell them, I say, well, all you got to do is walk across the street. Uh, that, that one day there's going to be the one that's going to come. And that's going to be the one who takes my place. See, because I don't want to be where I'm at forever. That's right. Some of us get to the place where we, we want to die on, the, on wherever spot that we're at. And we haven't figured out that we need to have a secession plan. Right? So I don't plan to be the director of the Africana Institute forever. I, I, I plan to be training some folks to become the director so that I can go do some other stuff, right? What's the next step in my revolution? What's the next step in the, the transformative ways in which that I'm going to be doing what I'm doing? So I need to be plotting and planning for how I'm going to do the next thing, as opposed to plotting and planning to make sure nobody else can come to my space. See, that's the wrong mission. That's just like electoral politics. I've ran for office three times. As in electoral politics, you get to the place where everything you do, or most of the things you do about your next election, mm -hmm. you don't even focus on where you're at and what your mission that you said you was about there in the first place. We got to stay focused on the mission. And sometimes it takes new ideas to wake us up to the mission. So the revolution, when you go and you see that picture of Malcolm X with the gun, some people are like, oh, I don't want to see that. Mm -hmm. No, but Malcolm with the gun, which way was it pointing? It was pointing up. He was saying that you got all that confusion up there. Let's blow that out. He, had, he didn't have the gun. It, 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 it could have been for protection for his house, but we need to get, use the gun, the, the weapons, to, to transform our own reality. right? And so when we transform our own reality, then we have the power to uh, move into the next thing so that we can figure out how we're going to do it, who we're going to partner with who we're going to uh, uh, find that unity with. And this is the last thing I'm going to say, is that, is that when we think about uh, the Nguzo Saba, right, with Kwanzaa, mm -hmm. that the key comes back to unity. Mm -hmm. And the Nguzo Saba has unity in it three times. We only think about the first word, Umocha. Uh -huh. But when you think about Ujima and Ujama, that's all about unity. Yes. We have to have unity that's holistic. See, unity has to be in our education. It has to be in our economics. It has to be in our politics. It has to be in our social uh, 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 relations. It has to be in our cultural development and understanding. So when you go back and you're getting that Sankofa bird, use that Sankofa bird to build the unity that's going to take and catapult us to the next place. All right? Peace. Thank you. Oh, and I just want to say uh, what Larry was saying, uh, uh, William Pepper's book, Order to Kill, it's a useful book. Uh, it got some stuff in there. Tell, I, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with everything in it, but it has some useful stuff in there. It's going to help you to understand uh, what happened and what didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, brother. That brother's so tall, i got to pull the mic. <laughs> Give him a hand. Give Dr. Calfine your hand. The next person... I'm going to ask to speak, has been with Pop for a long time, but only when we in trouble do we ask him to come and say something. <laughs> and that's Bennett Zorowski. Bennett is, Lawyer, that's it, right. That's right. <laughs> Bennett is one of the attorneys that has worked over the years with the People's Organization for Progress, has helped keep me out of jail, has represented me in court. Uh, but more than that, is not a lawyer that's just in the courtroom. Have y'all noticed he's the guitar player with the <laughs> Solidarity <laughs> Singers? <laughs> <laughs> he's at every right, wherever the Solidarity Singers are, he is. And he's in the street with us, but I, I'm most thankful, well, I'm thankful for Bennett on many levels, but one of the reasons I'm most thankful for him is the role that he played in the struggle, the fight to keep Muhlenberg Hospital open. That's right. That's right. 
Bennett fought with us, particularly on the legal front, going through the various legal structures all the way up to forcing the uh, New Jersey Board of, what was it called? The Health? Not, is the Board of, what is it? The Commissioner of Health. The Commissioner of Health, for, forcing the Commissioner of Health to come into Plainfield, to have hearings in Plainfield, going into court to file injunctions to keep the process of takeover from going forward, fought it all the way up to the uh, Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey. And it was one of the, it was, it was a real model of how the legal, the, 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 the legal action and the street action work in tandem to try to bring about the right result. And I swear to this day, if we had just gotten a notice six months early, just six months, that Muhlenberg was going to close, we'd have, we'd have been able to keep that yeah, hospital right. open. So I asked Bennett to come tonight when we were at the King Rally March yesterday uh, to say, come and say something about the jeopardy that civil rights and civil liberties is in. Dr. King fought for civil rights and he was an activist for civil liberties, uh, especially the freedom of assembly and the freedom of speech. And I asked Bennett to come and address how those things are in jeopardy today. Give him a big hand, Bennett Zarrat. Thank you for the introduction, which was uh, kinder than I deserve. Um, I. Dr. King was, among his many accomplishments, and the accomplishments of the movement that he was an important and leading member of, a pioneer in developing, making the First Amendment meaningful. And there were two aspects of the First Amendment that he was especially important in. That's the freedom of speech and the freedom of association. We often forget that the First Amendment protects our freedom to associate with one another and to advocate, and then there's the third right, to petition the government. All of that is in the First Amendment. And Dr. King made those rights meaningful and effective, along with many others in the movement, because up until the 50s, when he got started, the First Amendment was on the books, but it wasn't very much respected. Uh, when power opposed it, it wasn't much expected. When the Birmingham uh, boycott began, that was in the heart of the McCarthy era, mm. the heart of the communist right. bashing. And the government and the courts certainly were not respecting the rights of people to associate with the Communist Party, to, to articulate the ideas that were put forward by the Communist Party, and not just the Communist Party, but any breed of socialism. That's why socialism, that's when socialism became a, a dirty word to a great extent. That's why J. Edgar Hoover's constant unremitting campaign against uh, Dr. King uh, always focused on the charge that he was a communist and that if he wasn't actually a communist, he was the pawn of his friends like Stanley Levinson, mm. who were at one time had been communists. Right. And that was supposed to totally undercut the value of Dr. King. J. Edgar Hoover's theory was that if he could make that stick, well, then no one would pay any attention to Dr. King, would show him to be a fraud and a puppet of Russia, of all things. Can you imagine? <laughs> Trump is but not Trump. the first person that the FBI has suggested was a puppet of uh, Russia, although they had much less evidence to make the charge against Dr. King than they have against our that? current occupant. White House. That's right. And the way Dr. King made these rights meaningful was by living them and being prepared 
to violate the law as it was written in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Georgia, in Chicago, in all the places where he fought his struggles to say, no, we have a right to get together and demand these things of the government. And we have the right to do it in the strongest possible nonviolent way. And yes, I'm a spokesperson, and I'm an especially eloquent spokesperson. There are few who can match Dr. King in oratory ever. But the strength of speech came from the association of thousands of people, maybe millions of people across the country, but especially the people who were prepared to go out into the streets of Selma, go out into the streets of Birmingham, go out in the streets of Chicago in the face of mob violence and stand and march for those ideals and say in one of the songs that I, that I sang on Tuesday at the rally, uh, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. That's right. Uh, the, the most, you know, Larry mentioned the Solidarity Singers. Our theory is we try not to hew to any particular party line but to show up wherever we're asked to show up to support causes that we believe in and to try and build broad solidarity. It's the broad solidarity that freedom of association brings that is the true strength of all of our movements. And we have to learn to come out and support each other and do that. Which brings us to what's going on today. The state of free speech law is not too bad right now in the country. The, the Supreme Court, as conservative as it is, and even the, what we like to refer to as Uncle Justice Thomas, uh, are, are strong believers in almost a literal interpretation of, the free, of free speech. Maybe that's because he was fond of pornography that he feels so strongly about the issue. Although he doesn't say that in his opinions. Uh, but what's interesting is how they have warped the freedom of association and how even free speech they have warped because they have elevated the power of money and the right of corporations to associate yes. Yes. while giving them the full range of free speech that all of us should be entitled to. And they've used the right of association to break up the power of working people when they try to associate, which is what the decision was all about with the public sector unions when they said that you can't, that, that a public entity can't sign a contract which requires its workers to pay an agency fee to a union. The fact of the matter is that unions have been the most effective force in this country over the longest period to, through association and joining ordinary working people together to advance the rights in this country. And therefore, they've been the number one enemy of the corporate state, of the plutocracy. And they said, well, you know, they sign a contract, but by forcing these people to pay, even just for the services that they actually benefit from, that's violating their freedom of association. They, it's true that part of the freedom of association is the right not to associate with somebody. Mm. You can't force me to support your cause and come out for you if I don't want to. I have a right not to. That's why we have a right. That's why schools are not allowed to require people to say a prayer at the start of sessions because that would force children and families to associate with a set of beliefs that they might not share or that they know they do not share. Mm -hmm. So you have that right. But they're using that, a corrupt expansion of it, to tear it apart. They don't say that the big corporations of the world, that Lockheed 
shouldn't be able to use any of the tax dollars that they're paid for their weapons to lobby Congress in support of war. Why isn't that taking my money, my tax dollars, and forcing me through my dollars to associate with Lockheed's shameful lobbying in support of selling more weapons so that the Yemeni people can be bombed? No, no, no. That they love. They're a corporation. It's their money once they get it. They own it. They can spend it any way they like, including swamping Congress with lobbyists, swamping the media with their propaganda, and that's fine. The Supreme Court has said that. And, you know, corporations are human beings. Uh, you know, I, my favorite sign is, I believe corporations are human beings when Texas executes one in the electric chair. <laughs> uh, you know. That's a mouthful. God damn. But, uh, but, uh, so we got to watch out for that. The threat to civil liberties, the biggest threat to civil liberties of this country is the man in the White House. And more than the man in the White House, his so-called base. Because they are skilled users of the right of the First Amendment. I got to credit them. They're, they're good organizers. I mean, it helps when you got the Koch brothers pouring in millions and millions of dollars to, to fund the organizers, something that we don't have. But, you know, they, they've used the First Amendment to get where they are. But make no mistake about it, they are fascists. Trump wants to be a, a fascist. He wants to be an autocratic leader. You can see it in the government shutdown now. Right. What does shutting down the government have to do with his argument to try and convince people that we need a wall? Why are we endangering food stamps? Why are we shutting down the Department of Environmental Protection? Why are we not funding the Coast Guard? He's not even paying the border agents. How, how that's supposed to help the, how that's supposed to help his cause, I don't know, you know. Border agents already. It's, it, a year doesn't go by that some border agents don't get indicted for accepting bribes from the coyotes and the drug smugglers, wow. right? Well, gee, you're sure going to prevent them from accepting bribes if you don't pay them. <laughs> that, that, that's, how, that's how nonsensical his policies are. They make absolutely no sense. They do nothing but impose suffering upon ordinary working people. And, of course, he consistently shows an absolute lack of understanding of what it's like not to be born into a millionaire daddy's home, right? I mean, oh, everybody, it's not such a big deal not to get your paycheck. What's he doing? You have to listen to him. We will not open the government until you agree to this one thing. It makes no sense. Even Lindsey Graham tells him he ought to open up the government. But he and his henchman McConnell, who's one of the most evil persons yes. in the history of the United States, <laughs> uh, you know, are refusing to open the government. Why is that? Because Trump believes that he should have absolute control. He's the top dog. He understands one thing only, bullying. It hasn't been working for him but has been doing a good job of enjoying, of destroying institutions. To the extent he wishes to destroy institutions, he's doing a terrific job. Just ask the European Union. Just ask Angela Merkel. Why do you hate Angela Merkel? There are two reasons. Number one, she's a woman. Number two, she believed that refugees should be treated like human beings and tried to get Europe to be welcoming to the people who were fleeing Syria and even Africa for, for economic reasons, because she believed they should be treated like human beings. So he hates her. And he does all he can to destroy the European Union, of which she was the strongest leader. So we have to be sure, you know, people talk about the resistance, and some people laugh at it because it's 
kind of broad based. It's fuzzy as to what it wants other than opposition to him. But it's the people in the streets, and we have to be there and pop, Lord knows, or it's in the streets more than any other group I know of in New Jersey, certainly. And, you know, for, for all the right causes. You know, Larry says that we show up a lot, and it's true that we try to show up a lot, uh, either as a solidarity singers or individually, but I can't come anywhere near it close to keeping up with Larry mm -hmm. and, and with what your organization does. But that's the most important thing because he is following the fascist playbook. Yep. He is absolutely following the fascist playbook. You know, you, you can read the historians who are experts on this, and they all pretty much agree it's a fascist playbook. And the number one tool is the one that, that Hitler and his friend Goebbels pioneered, the big lie. Because Trump, you know, never never says anything that's true. I mean, it's almost, it's, 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 it's harder to find his true statements than his false statements. You know, there, there was a famous statement, someone once said, I think it was Lillian Hellman, talking about one of her literary rivals. Every word out of her mouth is false, including and and the. <laughs> uh, that, that's pretty much where Trump is. And his goal is to have absolute power. Right. And while he's not bad on free speech now, if he gets that absolute power, you can be sure that he's going to use it to crush our enemies. So. We have to use it, or we have to lose it, as they say. And uh, I'm proud to be speaking about this in Dr. King's memory, because he was a great exemplar of that. And I'm very happy to be speaking about that to Pop, of which I'm a proud member, because you are some of the, this organization is one of the greatest proponents of that. Uh, work certainly in the state of New Jersey, and frankly, I think across the country today. Uh, so keep it up and remember how important it is. Power to the people. Thank you very much. Okay, power to the people. Uh, I actually prefer solidarity for it. <laughs>
55 in the following year, and they are still with us. And that is Miss Claudette Colvin, who was the first one to plead not guilty. She uh, resisted um, getting up on the bus before Rosa Parks did, at least of that year. That was uh, March 2nd, 1955. And then Mary Louise Smith Ware, who was 18 years old. Claudette Colvin was 15. Mary Louise Smith was uh, 18 in October, 20, October 22nd, 1955. And then, of course, Miss Rosa Parks. And the attorney for Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was about 26 years old, I think. And his attorney, Fred Gray, was 24 or thereabouts. And Fred Gray is still with us today. So I just wanted to give a shout out to those people. POP has been in contact with two of them. Hopefully we can make contact with Fred Gray. But let me just see if I can get this photograph that I want. Well, I'll just have to show it up here a little bit. Not perfect. But anyway, I just wanted to, I saw this on Facebook. They were doing this challenge, and I thought that this picture really helps to capture what I wanted to say or what needs to be said. And these are just like 10 years. These are examples of how the United States and imperialism spreads democracy. And on the left is before the U.S. invaded and on the right is after. Oh, yeah. And so we see Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Syria. Oh gosh, I gotta learn how to work this better. Hold but, it back up to the ceiling. Yeah, well, maybe you guys Or if somebody points right. it on this wall over here, it's a big blank yeah. wall. Maybe over there. But I just wanted people to see it. I don't have a whole lot to say about it, but I just wanted us to get a sense of it somewhat. That war is real. And one of the things that we have to understand about the time when Martin Luther King gave his now famous Why I Oppose the Vietnam War back in 1967, and we heard our brother Reverend Dougherty refer to the fact that when he gave that speech, he infuriated so many people. Now we have to just imagine this, that Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was perhaps one of the, one of the friendliest or one of the presidents ever that we could work with, he certainly had, Martin Luther King certainly had his ear, and legislatively, there were um, some victories. Of course, there were always problems with what did get passed, and King was not very satisfied with that, but still, still, we have not seen a president since LBJ who was so willing to at least try to work with people in the movement. And so when King made that speech, LBJ was president, the Democrat was president, somebody that many in our community considered a friend, but King was uncompromising, uncompromising in saying and in speaking the truth that America was the largest purveyors of violence in the world. And he said, he said, I can't talk to people over here, to black children over here, and tell them or talk to them about nonviolence while America is, is bombing brown children and people of color overseas. That's right. That's and we have only, this country has only grown far worse, far worse since that time. It is estimated, and I'm sure these estimates are off, but that since World War II, and I'm not talking about the amount of people who were killed in World War II. Those numbers were astronomical. But since World War II, there's been like the, from 20 to 30 million people killed. Wow. And I'm sure that's an off number. I'm trying to even understand and get the numbers of the people who were killed during these present wars that are so ill-defined and without end, and with no end game in sight. None in sight. And when you think about it, for at least 18 years, this country has been overtly at war, overtly at war. And yet, the anti-war movement many times has been so silent. Now, those pictures that we just saw, to just give a little bit of a background within the last 10 years, we know, and we all, I don't think anybody in this Room disagrees that Trump is the worst personification probably of anything we've ever seen. But 
It is about this system because Trump did not do most of that there. That was done under other presidents. That was done under one president, very popular, very suave, but the truth is the truth. Barack Hussein Obama started by George uh, W. Bush, and we know that when his father who did invade Iraq and was the head of CIA, the CIA and all of that, when he died, he should have. <laughs> but however, revisionism is calling him a hero. Right. And you have black elected officials right. who will talk about Martin Luther King That's right. and in the same breath call George Bush a hero. You will have people, John McCain, when he died, they called him a war hero, a war hero fighting in, in a moral war. There are no such things as war heroes. When you are fighting on the wrong side of a war and it is immoral and you are bombing innocent people, there's no such thing as a hero like that. However, today though, they're hijacking his name and his memory and they will call, they'll talk about King and McCain and all these people in the same breath. We've got to challenge that. We've got to change that. We have to do that. We know that there is something now called Africom. That's right. Africom. And King, in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? And I left this book at home. I'm so mad because I wanted to read this quote. But King talked about how they will be electing our leaders. He literally said that, putting them before us. And they will basically be doing the bidding for the United States of America. He didn't use those words. I, I can't say it the way he did, but that's basically what he Someone said. Read the book, though. We got exactly. That's basically what he said. And so, we have AFRICOM, and regardless of how people might feel about this person personally, but who better, who could possibly have delivered exactly what this country wanted on the continent of Africa but Barack Hussein Obama. And prior to him being president, I think there were only about, what, two bases or something on the continent, and George Bush wasn't doing very well, you know, trying to get them bases built, but in comes Barack Hussein Obama, who we knew about because he got the coveted spot at the Democratic National Convention when they just put him out there, and I was like, who is he? Why did he get that spot? But anyway, he did, and that's what basically thrust him into the, uh, the spotlight, and now um, out of about what, 53 countries, I think there are 49 bases, AFRICOM, U.S. military bases on the continent of Africa, and the largest facility for building drones is located in a place called the Djibouti, I hope I'm pronouncing it. That's right. Located there on the continent of Africa. $21 trillion. I'm not going to, this is not, but this is not the Pentagon budget, okay? This is not all that was spent in the Pentagon. This is what is unaccounted for. Twenty-one trillion dollars. Oh, yeah, now I'm just going to give you an idea of how much money twenty-one trillion dollars is because it's really an unfathomable amount. I just said, I might as well have just spoken Greek or whatever to you because nobody really can comprehend how much that is, but I'll give you an idea. It would take somebody making $40,000 a year, 25 million years, to make $1 trillion. And like I said, that is just, um, that's what's unaccounted for. That's not the total military budget or anything like that. That's just what they don't have a record of. They can't figure out what happened. But basically they're saying though there was no, nothing you know, nothing underhanded about that, no corruption or anything. They just can't figure it out. But it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything at all. So we don't need to worry. They just can't. They don't know where it is. Well, it's, oh, <laughs> hello. That, that's where they're looking. Welfare and food stamps. But, you know, I know with this crowd, we all know so much about King. But the challenge is how do we live what he was talking about? How do we make this real? There is no end game in sight for these. In fact, the president who has maybe said the most anti-war uh, 
things is the one who's currently in the um, White House. And many times they might talk about pulling a troop, pulling troops from one country, but basically they're really not talking about ending a war. They're just reshuffling at them and moving them around. But still, he has probably said probably some of the strongest uh, anti-war rhetoric, you know, than anybody else has said. And that's 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 a bad thing. That's not a good place that we're at at all. And nobody, people are elected without even asking where they stand on these wars. 18 years straight that we're going into overt wars. We have to change this. We have a challenge in this room. All of us do. Wherever we go, how do we change this? How do we make King, what he talked about, how do we live it? How do we make it real? We just can't have him be being, just giving euphemisms to people because that's what they're doing to him. We have to up this, we have to up our game. We have to demand it. We need to demand from anybody. I don't care if they're running for dog catcher. Where do you stand on these wars? What is your position in these wars? Wars now, and we mean in them. We don't mean just pulling troops from one area or, or even um, drilling down on the presence of troops. We mean end these wars. We have to. We have to. Um, you know, we have to uh, bring that. We have to make that part of our platform. We should ask anybody running for any office, and especially running for um, federal offices and state offices. We need to know where do you stand on these wars, and we need to give them a position. We need to really make that, um, we can't bargain with that. We need to make that a, you know, a deal breaker. If you are not for ending these wars, you will not get our support. How many more people must die? Just because they don't talk about them or show them doesn't mean that people are not being killed by that. And then just last, I want to just talk about one other thing real briefly, and that's the entertainment industry. And when they build, when they have all these wonderful movies and all these superhero movies and all that kind of stuff, that is recruitment material for the armed forces. Yes, and, and the, 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 um, the relationship that Hollywood has with the um, the U.S. military industrial complex is a real, it's a real one and it's a very complicated one, but they can't get those movies made, those super duper, super power movies and all that kind of stuff and superheroes, they can't get them made for the most part unless they work with the military industrial complex because they provide all the equipment and everything that they need and if they don't do what they want them to do, those movies will not get made. They can't use their equipment. And they usually get script approval rights, and they will make sure that those movies are told the way they want them told. We all love the, um, we all love the, um, the Tuskegee Airmen, but there's a reason why they talk about them so much, because when they put movies out that emphasize the Tuskegee Airmen and what black people did in those movies, that results in recruitment for the military. They'll have people going to these recruiting bases and signing up to be in them because it makes you feel good. So these are things we have to watch when we all know the movie The Black Panther. Uh -huh. Well, if you look, yes. think about that message. Yes. yes, 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 yes. But that basically results in recruitment for the military CIA. industrial complex, exactly, and the many ways in which they get their messages across all the time. So we gotta amplify our voices. We really have to do that. We have to make this real. So, no more, but maybe sometimes we can have a, um, a forum about exactly what do we do to really up the, um, exactly, the anti-war message. A big hand. Everything she said is true. Everything. And, and I say that because, that's right, and I say that because some people might say, well, not that it's not, well, she's exaggerating. No, nothing she said is an exaggeration. The military really cannot account for $21 trillion. Now you know the trillion, she just gave you one 
stat, right? But a trillion is 1,000 billion. A billion is 1,000 million. So we talk about 21,000 million dollars. Anyway, our next speaker is our is the People's Organization for Progress Poet Laureate. <laughs> he's our uh, he's our poet they laureate. They gonna ban me, right? <laughs> no, we never ban you. We we move we 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 we're elevating you, brother. We're pushing you up there. He's a uh, a former, not a former, but a member of the Black Panther Party, the new Black Panther Party, the old Black Panther Party, all the Black Panther Party. I love the movie. But most importantly, he's been doing a great deal of the press work for Pop, and I want to thank him for that. And I think one of the reasons that we had WPIX TV covering our march on Tuesday was because of Brother Zaid press release. So give Brother Zaid a big hand. And let's hear from Brother Zaid. Another man is gone. Another man is gone. Another man is gone, another man is gone, another man is gone. Shot him down like a dog. 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 Another man is gone. Cause his skin was dark Cause his skin was dark Cause his skin was dark Shot him down like a dog Another man is gone His killer's all wore a badge His killer's all wore a badge Killers all wore a badge, shot him down like a dog. Another man is gone. They will all walk away. They will all walk away. They will all walk away, shot him down like a dog. Another man is gone. But it won't be long. But we get it on. Say it won't be long, but we get it on. Another man is gone. 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 because I didn't want to break it because I know how much it costs. There you go. For <laughs> <laughs> being real. To my esteemed elders in the house and to my left and to my right, but mostly Gray Willard Coldfield who should be on this panel instead of yeah. me, quite frankly. <laughs> right? <laughs> to my elder who's in the party, Mr. Patrice, Brother Adam, they also, one of them ought to be a, on a panel other than me in the house. I salute you. Right, my elder who's been at my back for some decades now, Baba Manifu, right? Uh, and we're we'll talking about this, this right in front of us. He's never on these panels, and he should be sometime. Mm -hmm. Talk about the war in Vietnam. We got a comrade from Vietnam. I mean, this is, this is deeply personal to some of us. Do we not understand that two million people in Vietnam were killed? Yeah. Seeking to unify and liberate their country, and they still won. Yes. Huh? All oh, power to the people ain't no damn smoking. That's right. They still won. Yes. Yes. Still won. I know we're talking about nonviolence. 
But in the face of that, we understand we have to do whatever is necessary to save ourselves and to do for ourselves and to free ourselves. There was nobody more loved by our people at that time than the great Dr. King. We all know that and can see that. And those who didn't love him and who were giving him a hard time in their political immaturity, we need to dismiss that for the political immaturity that it was, even in our disagreement. Black Panther Party, and this is the lens from which I speak, had three major growth spurts. First was Sacramento. Brothers went up those steps right. while Ronald Reagan was, was there. Yep. Had them all peeing in their pants. <laughs> An armed protest over the right to bear arms. Yes. And that caught the imagination of black men all over the country like nothing they had seen in, in some time. And then there was 1967. And what happened in Newark in 1967? What happened in Detroit in 1967? Because of the scourge of police brutality and the filthy conditions that our people have been oppressed and abused in, those towns went up in smoke. And out of that smoke came revolutionary organizing and more young men and women ran into the Black Panther Party. And then, April 4th, 1968, of all the people that had to be, whose life had to be lost violently, they would take that brother away from us? That was the straw that broke the black camel's back of non-violence for young people who made the golden age of 1960s, and they too would come into the Black Panther Party. I would dare say if Dr. King was with us, he would probably be a political prisoner. Because he was so on so many fronts that actually undresses the empire for all of its oppressive shame. And we still got a whole lot of political prisons. I'm going to give you a new name I want you all to pay attention to since we're talking about association, Brother Bennett. And it's not being talked about. I got Pam coming into Newark Saturday for Mamiya. You know that. Right? And you know all the stuff that I've been done, doing over the years for my elder comrades in the party around their freedom. But Mumi is a journalist. There's a sister, a very stately sister, by the name of, I want y'all to remember this name, Marzia Hashemi. Born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Slave name is Melanie Franklin. The face, the black face of Iranian media. Now see, now most of y'all don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But see, I got media context to go from here to Sydney, Australia. Mm -hmm. And I pay attention to press TV from Iran. The U.S. government snatched this sister up coming to the country to see her brother who is sick with cancer. No press, no statements, no charges, and shackles, trying to throw pork at her violating her dress code, basically being tortured. And not a word is being said anywhere in this country's media. What is that about? For all of this fake news about this joker not wanting war, he has been obsessed more than any other president since Carter got his behind embarrassed with Iran. So we need to watch that real careful. Yes, yes, yes. He would love to provoke a military incident with Iran. Yes, right. That's right. That's right. So there is, I mean, eight, 18 years of war, and I don't know how many bases and, and, and ongoing military uh, actions is not enough for this bloodsucker that is the empire of the United States government. That's right. That's right. So all of that in the end falls on people like you and me, us, as Malcolm would say. <laughs> this is our time. We have to recognize that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And we have to figure out in all the mistakes that we're going to make, in all of the limitations that we have in resources and, and bodies and, and, and whatnot, how are we going to keep at this thing until we turn this thing around? The arch of the universe, he said, is long, but it bends towards justice. We
We need to snap some ankles and some necks and some racist spines on the way to bending it towards justice. I know y'all want to be nonviolent, but for those of us who have our hands free, we ain't got no problems with you, uh, you know, make it happen what I'm talking about. But in the end, this is really on us. So I, I'll, I'll wind with the way I began. Uh, let me just also just acknowledge several things. I want to appreciate my comrade Ingrid Hill who's been in my Ooh. back pushing me with uh, what we're doing with NCAT, right? We have a very important forum coming up on the 28th, right? I want everybody, always work to do, absolutely. I want everybody to call us governor, you know. Do it. We all voted for him. He seems to be a nice guy. <laughs> right. But him and I, a couple days ago in Patterson, New Jersey, at a peaceful march where the police basically bum-rushed this peaceful assembly of young people, and it was mostly young people, with motorcycle squads and Mason were prepared to do a lot more than Mace. And to a man from the commanding officer on down to the last cracker on the back, it was all white policemen attacking this all black and brown crowd. It looked like 1963. And a lot of us in this room remember how that looks. For those of you that, that are not old enough to remember, you need to listen to some of us so y'all understand what we were talking about. That could have gotten dangerously out of control. There could have been some serious casualties in that whole thing. But some of us had to straighten them young heads out who didn't have a clue as to what the hell they were doing and what they were up against. You don't go into the streets unprepared. You just you think wolf tickets alone ago will protect your mind? They will crack your skull and your wolf tickets if you're not prepared for those kind of eventualities. There's a way to go in the streets. And, there, and it is important to take the streets. But prepare your people. And be prepared to protect them. And if you have to absorb casualties, be prepared to, uh, to do what you got to do to make sure that they're minimized and so that the work continues to go on and, it does, and no one, we don't lose steam and don't lose ground in the process. And I'm saying that out of love and respect for some young people who I appreciate, but they were not prepared for what happened. And it could have been worse. So there's a lot of work for all of us to do. We need to recognize what time it is. I'm going to use that to wind up and get ready to let uh, our vice chair get down because I know he's going to tear it up. All right? But this is what we got to do. So I'll end this way as I began. I was nurtured by a jazz poet by the name of Amiri Baraka. There you go, right? And there was a jazz composition called Monk's Dream. Right? Right. Went up to the mountain top. Went up his rough sides full of pits and drops. He saw with Jericho eyes, he told the people no lies. Man, oh man, what a dream. He turned preaching into people's hearts. Gave back the people in the South their heart. Did what had to be done, wasn't going to be afraid of anyone. Man, oh man, what a dream. One, two, three, four, five, six. Caught pure hell at every turn. Didn't think he'd survive. Mm -mm -mm. Yet he held on. Just kept going on. To keep that dream alive. He went up to the mountain top. Went up his rough sides full of pits and drops. And turned post sharecroppers into segregation stoppers. Man, oh man, what a dream. One, two, three, four, five, six. Or pure hell at every turn Didn't think he'd survive mm -mm. Yet he held on Just kept going on Had to keep that dream alive He went up to the mountain top Went up its rough sides Full of pits and drops Said what had to be said Knew he'd probably he'd wind up Hey, 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 hey. Man, oh man, that was a dream. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Man, oh man, what a dream. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Man, oh man, what a dream.
a dream. Keep it in the streets, all power. Yeah. Yeah. And now, to bring it home, our vice chairman, our esteemed vice chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, a friend of 40, almost 48 years. I met him when I was 17. I was, I was a freshman at Princeton, and he was the RA, the resident advisor. Yes. He's a, he's a, he's a scholar, a cum laude graduate of Princeton University, former trade union leader, president of the Mail Handlers Union for 15 years, and now our vice chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, Brother Larry Adams. Give him a big hand. Power to the people. I apologize for being ill prepared because I didn't know I was supposed to be on this panel. So I won't get <laughs> you can't read the email. <laughs> Is that what it was? <laughs> I apologize, but I'm honored and glad to have an opportunity to speak to the sons and daughters of Martin Luther King. And that's what POP is. It's an organized expression of continuity of the modern civil rights movement. Barbara Daughtry talked about the consistency and continuation of POP and how many have fallen by the wayside. But we have outstanding leadership and outstanding membership. And without both, nothing works. And so when we come to commemorate Dr. King, we come to commemorate the modern civil rights movement. Yes, right. And to grasp the relationship between the masses and their leaders, the leaders and the masses, yes. without which neither could succeed. Dr. King was pushed, was pushed reluctantly into the leadership of the civil rights movement in Montgomery. He was pushed by the movement of the masses. We come to commemorate him as the outstanding leader of that period of struggle, that apex of popular struggle, of both the struggle for democracy in this country and for the national liberation of the oppressed Afro-American people. It's that movement that pushed him forward. And he was successful, why? Because he captured the aspirations of the masses of Afro-American people in their end endless struggle against this legacy of slavery. They came down, it was manifest, in a struggle over who, where you're going to ride on, on public transportation. But what it did was broke open the struggle of the people who walked for 300 days. Instead of riding, broke open the demand for democracy in the territory of the Afro-American nation, and beyond that, amongst women in opposition to the war, the demonstration, the capacity to fight back was the black freedom struggle. And it was the spearhead for the struggle to transform this country. Yes. To transform this country, which is the leading imperialist power in the world, means breaking out the front to transform the world. So it is an honor to come here to recognize that leadership role of Dr. King, to synthesize the aspirations of the people, and to be able to capture the confidence of the people. So that whether they were in the, in the city, the, the specific city in which Dr. King was personally leading the struggle, there was inspiration so that the struggles were breaking out all over the country. And that there were battlefronts that were opened up. Ministers who had been reluctant got moved forward. Youth who inspired and sat in in Woolworths in, in Greensboro and then all across the South. So the youth movement, and, and it's, it's been pointed out there about a struggle of how we understand reform and revolution and what does it mean to go sit in a Woolworth in Carolina in 1960 that you were virtually taking your life in your hands. That's right. That if you look at the Children's March, people watched on the sidewalk. Now we might say, oh, it's two streets, our streets. That could get you killed. That could get you killed. And many people were killed. 
That's right. So we come to commemorate Dr. King, we come to commemorate the movement. The movement that pushed Dr. King forward and he was able to use his talent. Yes. To use the talents that he had curried in that whole 39 years before he was taken from us. And so we come and we, we who struggle to transform the world, not out of nowhere, not out of our great heads, but out of the actual social practice that many of us witnessed, or if not, gained through secondary knowledge, and honor that movement that has moved so far in transforming this country and the world. And so we see Dr. King as a role model. And what makes him that? He's willing to study, willing to sacrifice all that he had. He died a poor man. But he demonstrated, if I could sum it up, his selfless devotion to the freedom struggle of the Afro-American people and for the struggle for the liberation of humanity. Yes. He's demonstrated selfless devotion to that struggle. And they say, if you know, take that out of general terms. Well, I would say, one, we want to look at Dr. King as, as and it's, we've had this discussion when we talk about Malcolm, about the willingness to grow and change. Some of that, I think, uh, you know, uh, Reverend Dorchy drew, drew out and Chairman pointed out in, in our rally. Some of that's tactical decisions about what to say and how to say it, when, how to talk in code. You know, those of us who read Marxist Lenin's classics, if you put the put to Lenin and Marxist stuff in its historic perspective, there were there were censors. And they put forward programs of revolutionary struggle in coded language. Well, using the biblical references as part of that coded language, and it was pointed out, and I would I, I think that it, it was one of the profound things that was said. It requires political maturity. Right. It requires political maturity to recognize the outcome. Why did they execute, assassinate Dr. King? Because the united front against U.S. imperialism was coming into being. It wasn't just a black freedom struggle but that his internationalist understanding had come forward and that the world recognized his power, his influence, his political authority. Recognized that. And that he therefore became a danger to the empire. Yes. And therefore he had to go. Yes. Eleven intelligence agencies and the local police and all sorts of snitches and traitors and cowards within the black freedom movement or amongst the black people's movement. That's right. Because when he came out against the war, he denounced U.S. imperialism by saying, my government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. In the world. That's right. that is, U.S. imperialism is the greatest oppressor of the people. That's right. That's right. And I stand on the side of justice. I stand on the site of liberation, and therefore I, on the side of liberation, and therefore I don't stand on the side of my government, quote unquote, because it's my government. And if you follow the money, all those traitors and snitches and bought off peacemakers, peacemakers amongst the rising militants of the black freedom struggle, all turned on him. All turned on him. And they cut off the funds because that they wanted to divert and push the freedom struggle in a certain way. They cut off the funds and tried to isolate him and denounce him. And it took some time before the radical king could be recognized and upheld. Well, POP is part of maintaining recognition. Every one of our people speaking here spoke yesterday all in one way or another said we must preserve the legacy of the radical Martin Luther King. Yes, sir. That's what we came to commemorate and we commemorate tonight. Then he spoke overtly against the manifestations and the phenomena of oppression and exploitation and called for a radical transformation of the social, economic, political system. I say that rudimentarily Dr. King called for socialism that he called for socialism, that he called for down with U.S. imperialism. 
And that's the legacy. See, I came today, and you all did too, to engage in class struggle in the realm of ideas about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Our class enemies, the oppressors, those who are purveyors of empire, would turn Dr. King into a dreamer who had nice ideas. But what his social practice was, was as a militant freedom fighter. Militant in tone, militant in voice, militant in behavior, challenging the forces of oppression in the territory of the Afro-American nation in the Deep South and up South in Chicago, who said it was almost, in his comments, I think, where it was almost worse in Chicago than it was in Alabama and Mississippi. But we come to preserve and remember the radical king. We struggle to recognize and uphold our hero and not let him be reshaped by our enemies. I want to thank Lisa so much for focusing on right. Right. focusing on the right. necessity to oppose imperialist war. Right. All of right. them. That's right. I, 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 most of what I wanted to say was said by somebody else, but I'd like to pull it together somewhat if I can. We live in the belly of the beast, and Dr. King identified the main enemy of the world's people, U.S. imperialism, the imperialist system led by U.S. imperialism in the greatest purveyor speak. That he pointed to what the, what the solution is, the radical transformation. I say that Dr. King would have, at some point, but that he rudimentarily called for socialism and Afro-American national liberation. Free my people, I stand, on the, I stand and move throughout the South, mobilizing, organizing, agitating. Let us be inspired by the attitudes and the behavior of Dr. Martin Luther King. Let us emulate his spirit and his selfless devotion in conduct to the freedom struggle. Let us struggle for the transformation of this country. Let us fight for socialism and Afro-American national liberation. And let us oppose U.S. imperialism in Iraq, in Afghanistan, because they're focusing on the Middle East. And our responsibility to the world is to fight our common enemy right here and now to oppose their efforts to enslave other countries as we fight for our own freedom here and link it. And what's the link? That is a common system of monopoly capitalism that puts profit over people. We were the profit. That's right. We were the profit. Right. Enslaved Africans were worth more than all the banks, railroads, factories in the country. That's right. It is the primitive accumulation of capital from enslaved Africans that allowed this beast to grow. They owe us, but they owe the world. We have, like the brother said, Sal seized the time opportunity to do the best that we can to strangle the beast from in his, within his belly. But on this occasion, when we, rec when we celebrate the birth of an international hero of humanity who belongs particularly to the Afro-American freedom struggle. Let us say Martin Luther King lived like him. Yeah. Dare to struggle and dare to win. Power to the people. Power to the people. He summed it up, didn't he? Let us give all our speakers a hand. I am uh, going to struggle to refrain from trying to speak. If, if you want to hear my thoughts on this, I'll be speaking at the Union Baptist Church on Sunday morning. That's the one you don't want me to advertise. Don't advertise. But I'm letting you know. 
If you want to come to the, um, the Union Baptist Church on Midland Avenue in uh, Montclair, New Jersey, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. But let me just say a couple of things. One, Dr. King was assassinated when he was 39 years old. Just think about that. Many of us in this room, we are way beyond that. He was assassinated at 39, and by the way, Malcolm was the same age when he was assassinated, 39. But think about this. Dr. King was assassinated at 39, but he wasn't in the civil rights struggle for 39 years. His presence in the civil rights struggle was only 13 years. Pop is 35 years old. So we're honoring Dr. King for only 13 years of work. Right? Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955. Martin Luther King, April 4th, 1968. That's only 13 years. But he did more in that time than most people have done in three or four lifetimes. It's really something to consider. How bright his star was and then how suddenly it burned out. Martin Luther King was a Christian. But he did not let his Christianity serve as a barrier between he and people of other faiths. I could even show you a picture. I know some of y'all are not going to believe this. The people who've been in pop know. But I can show you a picture of Martin Luther King meeting with Elijah Muhammad. 66. Meeting with Elijah Muhammad. I hear all this controversy now. They attacking young Tamika Mallory because she... Uh, uh, met with and worked with Minister Farrakhan. But Dr. King, who everybody professes to love, not only met with Elijah Muhammad, but if you read Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, he expressed admiration for aspects of the black Muslim nation of Islam program. It's in there. Don't take my word. Don't take my word for it. Go to Chicago without seeing Elijah. That's right. At the end of his life, Dr. King was one of the most hated people in the United States. Among black people, there was only a 25% approval rate in 1968. They had done such a con job once he came out against the war in Vietnam, and even before his announcement on the war in Vietnam, there was distance growing between King and LBJ. There had been essentially an agreement, maybe not a formal agreement, maybe an informal agreement, maybe it was a wink and a handshake, maybe it wasn't one no handshake at all, but there was an understanding that the civil rights leaders would not speak about the war in Vietnam. And in return, LBJ and the Democrats would ferry the Civil Rights Act of 64 through Congress. And Dr. King had to wrestle with this. And keep in mind, King's first speech on Vietnam was not April 4th, 1967 at Riverside. His first speech was actually at the end of 1966 in Alabama. And King was actually pushing, you know, people were joking tonight, why did Stokely, now we know as Kwame, refer to King as the Lord? Because there was a contradiction between Snick and King. Snick was ahead of Dr. King for what other re for whatever reason, whether it was an intentional or unintentional. Snick came out against the war in Vietnam as early as 1963. The Nation of Islam and Malcolm X had come out against 
U.S. presence in Vietnam as early as 1960, okay, maybe now, even the, maybe the, even the, before. The, 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 so there were other the, elements the, the, in the Black Liberation Movement that, on some issues, particularly on the uh, issue of uh, colonialism and imperialism that may have been ahead, not may, that were ahead of Dr. King. Even though Dr. King expressed openly support for the anti-colonial struggle, even though those struggles were violent, Dr. King never spoke against any of the liberation movements. And in fact, Kwame Nkrumah invited, to Dr. invited Dr. King, and Dr. King came to Ghana the day that Ghana got its independence from Britain. Black Star Flag. That's right. and, and you have seen the pictures that I have posted about this on Facebook. Dr. King came from a family of preachers. His father was a preacher, his grandfather was a preacher, and his great-grandfather was a preacher. That's something to keep in mind because in, in, in trying to bring out the radical essence of Dr. King, we also don't want. We also want to avoid the danger of trying to make him appear to be something he was not. You know, he was a Christian preacher. He, as in his own words, a follower of the disciple. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. But if you really a disciple of Jesus Christ, you'll be a revolutionary. Yes, sir. You'll be a revolutionary. You know, I hear people talk about Jesus, but they never talk about what happened when he went into the temple with the money changers. He kicked the tables over. Not only that, not only that, you got to read all four Gospels. That's right. They said Jesus came into the temple with a cat of nine. This is in the Bible. This is the King James first. That's right. This ain't no secret stuff here. With a cat of nine tails. That's a whip with nine cords to it. That's right. That was often tied with sharp pieces, had sharp pieces. And whip the money changer. People don't talk about That's that. Right. But you know, Dr. King was 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 probably one of the forerunners of Black Liberation theology. I don't want to keep people because I said I wasn't going to do this, but I do want to end with this. We say Dr. King was a revolutionary. Why do we say that? Because Dr. King was trying to make revolution. Now, it's important to understand what a revolution is. Right. A revolution is not personal self-improvement. Personal self-improvement is personal self-improvement. A revolution is not a college course. A revolution is not an education regimen, although education regimen is part of revolution. Revolution is when you attempt to change the existing social order. When you attempt, through whatever means available to you, to remove the existing people in power from power and replace them with a new power. Now, in what's called a working class revolution, the object is to remove the capitalist ruling class and replace it with working class power. But that's what revolution is. And when we refer to ourselves and others as that, we must do it with a discerning eye to make sure, in fact, we ourselves or whoever it is we're discussing are, in fact, engaging in that. Now, when we engage in that, it's, it's my fervent hope that revolution might be carried out nonviolently. That's a hope that I have. That's a hope that Karl Marx had. Marx, in the 19th century, had said because of the level of educational development and the particular uh, political systems that existed in the United States and in advanced capitalist countries, a peaceful transition might be possible. He said might. He didn't say would. He said might. And of course, we don't want violence. Why would, why would we want to put any more people in jail? But this is what happens. Revolution is an act of self-defense. Revolution is not an act of aggressive uh, uh, violence. Most people are forced to pick up, 
to pick up instruments of violence to defend themselves from the violence of the state. That's how it gets on. It's not the oppressed who usually just rise up one more side because they know that the state got more guns than they got. But if the state is disappearing people, snatching people off the street, locking people up unjustly, killing people, assassinating people, at some point you might have to form your deacons for defense. You might have to form. You might have to form a BLA. You might have to form something to defend yourself from the violence of the state. And the state, make no mistake about it, exists on violence. State power exists on the mono on its monopoly of violence. The police, the National Guard, the Army the Navy, the Marines, those are instruments of violence designed to repress and oppress either people abroad and when necessary people at home. But I just say this so that we understand Dr. King was in DC in 68. His objective was to build a poor people's movement to engage in massive nonviolent resistance until Congress passed an Economic Bill of Rights. And this Economic Bill of Rights wasn't an original idea. FDR had promulgated an Economic Bill of Rights, I think it was the Four Rights, in, in the 1930s. And King picked up, how many? Four Freedoms in the 1930s, and King picked up on this. And he said, we're going to shut everything down until Congress passes guaranteed income, universal health care, living wage, education for all, affordable housing, elimination of poverty, on and on and on. He never got there because they killed him in Memphis because he wanted to change. That would require, what he wanted to do would require a revolutionary change. And when we founded the People's, of Org People's Organization for Progress, we founded it on the idea that we were going to continue the work of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all the martyrs of the civil rights and the black power movement. So I hope that people keep this in mind, what revolution is. And it's rough. It ain't fun. You lose friends. <laughs> you, you, you won't be popular. <laughs> but it is necessary. I just saw Andrews at the door. Uh, do we have any important, I, only important, if it ain't going to happen until two, we don't announce it. Anything coming up in the next three or four days, we got to announce. Only three or four days. Yeah, Reverend uh, Daughtry said the Dr. Martin Luther King Peace, Justice, and Unity March will take place January 23rd. First, the house of the Lord Church, 427 Martin Luther King Drive, Jersey City, at 11 o'clock. I may try to go there. What day is that? Monday. Monday. It's the 21st. Oh, I can't. I'm speaking. And Please. then uh, this weekend, Chairman, you should have it in your email. Is NJ Bick Saturday? Okay. Is their um, what is it? annual retreat? All right. Dr. Calvin. Yeah. Um, well, on. on um, Monday, the West Orange uh, Human Relations Commission is having their uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, program at Liberty uh, Middle School at um, 10 o'clock. And then the West Orange African Heritage Organization is having another one um, at 4 o'clock. Okay. The, the Suggestion, could you all forward them? Can you send me a send down it? Send the Women's send March in Atlantic City is dedicated to the memory of Fannie Lou Hamer. That's right. That's right. Yes. In the back. Donna. Yes, the Women's March is Saturday. I believe, Ingrid, are you going? Uh, it depends on the weather. Are you taking the banner? I brought it. So you want it? Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. No, yeah. All right. Yes, Donna. This um, Monday, were you going to raise standards and talk about yourself on Monday? 
Okay. On Monday, Dr. Cofield will be honored in Plainfield at that uh, annual breakfast. Um, just had it up. But it'll be at Plainfield High School at 9 a.m. Um, and the cost is $15 per person, but um, they're honoring this beautiful, great woman right here on Martin Luther King. Um, it was a participant at their um, annual breakfast on this Monday. Dr. Cofield being honored in her hometown. She's a prophet in her hometown. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is that it? Power to the people. Power to the people.